hey guys. Uh, we're going to go on to that second part of what you can do with a dog as far as traveling in the snow to make your life a little easier. Let me get the, uh, the equipment here and then we're going to kind of go over that, you know, before we head out. So hold on. Alright guys, so what we basically have is I took a, a kid's toboggan sled and I made it into a, a trapping sled or a pack sled, okay? Um, I set it up with a snub line, which is what I use to actually hold on and control the dog while he's out in front of me. I also can use this as a brake as well. That's attached to the sled here by the beaners. And then we have our shock absorber, much like the shock absorber we would use on a dog sled. And then it goes into one single tug line, which effectively becomes the center line and the tug line together because it's only one dog. All right, and he'll be attached to this. Also, what we have is the freighting harness that we're going to be using. All right, because we want that low point of attachment, and he's going to be carrying some heavy loads. Before we actually get this all together and we harness him up and we take him out on the trail and go through some trail things, what I want to do is I want to uh, I want to go over care issues. I want to go over dog assessment and things of that nature. So we're going to take it inside where it's a little bit warmer, and we're going to discuss that for a little bit. Okay guys, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this inside now. And I realize that this is probably going to be the more boring part of, you know, dog travel and using dogs in bushcrafting. But it's the necessary part too. Because if you don't keep your dog in good health, then <clears throat> you're not going to be able to go out and use him and enjoy his company while you're out in the woods if he's not in, you know, his best shape and he doesn't feel good. And if he gets hurt out there, it's going to put an end to your excursion while you're out there and or you need to handle emergencies where they may arise. Please be aware I am not a veterinarian by any stretch of the imagination. Although because of my long-term commitment to running dogs for the amount of years that I did, I had a very good working relationship with my veterinarian. She helped me um, understand a lot of mechanics about dogs and just generalize things that you can look for in dogs to help you assess their conditions while you're on the trail or while you're out doing your excuse me doing your excursions another thing too is because of where i work um, i had opportunity to know uh, many many canine officers and i would pick and prod their brain as well to look at other things that I may not see in a bushcraft setting, but things that were out there and prevalent that I had never thought of for assessments of my dogs as well. So the first thing that I actually want to get into right now is I want to talk about general dog care, um, your guidelines for keeping your dog fit. So let's take a look at those now. I'm going to be using a whiteboard. There is going to be a lot of information and you probably want to jot it down if you're not familiar with general dog care is obviously we need to have regular exams of the dog, you know, of your animals, all right? At least up to two times a year, you should bring them to the vet. The next thing that we want to keep in mind is that we want to keep the dog fit. We try to keep ourselves fit. That goes in with the dogs, and it could be just as simple as putting him out on a run or just taking him for a walk, you know, every day or every other day. However, you know, you can do that. If you can schedule it with your training and while you're out there, why not bring your dog? <clears throat> your vaccinations and deworming. Make sure you worm your dog every month. Make sure you, you have him current and up to date with his vaccines. Okay, we want to main high quality food. All right, whatever you can afford of the best quality for your dog, then so be it. I supplement my, my dogs with venison, any old venison that I have in the freezer. You know, I'll take it out, thaw it out, and give it to them. I don't bother cooking it. They don't eat it in the wild cooked. They don't need to worry about it. And I've never had a problem with any of my dogs eating any venison or even venison that I may have gotten from a roadkill deer as long as that venison was fresh enough. Like if it was just, just hit by a car, I'll take it home. If it's not too damaged, I'll cut it up and use it for the dogs. Fresh clean water, again, all the time, you want to have fresh clean water. You want to have it, your dog should have it as well.
All right, so let's talk about your basic assessment in a dog. And these are some of the things that you can do like this, even when there's no problem or that you don't even suspect that there is a problem. It just becomes nature. Okay, I usually look at my dog 30 to 40 to 50 times a day, right? He's older. He's a nine-year-old Malamute, okay? Things are going to start to happen with him. Things that have happened in the past to other dogs that I've had. Things, you know, problems that are inherent with large breed dogs, okay? Smaller breed dogs actually hide most of their stuff because they are smaller, they're compact, they're not working, you know, um, as hard per se as a, as a large breed dog. But when I'm out there, I constantly look at him to assess him and how he's feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just something that I have been accustomed to. These are some of the things that you want to look for. So under our first thing for basic assessment, we want to make sure that the dog is bright, alert, and responsive. And what I'm, I mean by that is, is that the dog, you call his name, he snaps his head right up, he looks right at you. His ears are pointed, and he's happy to see you. All right? He has normal ambulation. Okay? What I mean by that is, is that when he gets up, he doesn't have difficulties while he's getting up. He moves, and he comes right to you. Okay, or at least he makes the motion to come to you. If he's in the house, hey, he's good to go. If he's outside and he's in a kennel like my guy is, all right, he pops up and he moves and he goes right to the door waiting to see me. His eyes are focused and they're shiny. They're not dull, they're not lackluster. They're shiny eyes, they're bright eyes. His skin should be of a normal skin tugger. And what that means is, that when you pull up on his skin, it snaps right back, which means that he's um, well hydrated. A dog's normal heart rate, depending upon the breed of the dog, is anywhere from 70 to 140 beats per minute. Okay, he should have a strong pulse. The easiest place to find a pulse in a dog is in his femoral artery, which is right on the inside of his leg on either side. His respiratory rate, or his breathing rate, is anywhere between 10 and 30 beats per minute, again, depending upon the size and the breed of your dog. His temperature normally runs anywhere from 99 to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. This comes into play when we start talking about heat stroke and frostbite, which, yes, your dog can get frostbite. Lastly, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the dog has nice pink mucous membranes, you know, up inside the gums, you know, above the gum line. We want to make sure that's nice and pink. We want to check his capillary refill, and what we're going to do with that is, is that we actually just take our finger and press into the side of his gum. The gum, if it's pink, should turn white, and then um, the capillary refill, or the blood flowing back into that area of tissue, should be two seconds or less and it'll go pink again you know your dog's pupils there's an acronym it's called PERTL some people call it PERL but basically what it is is pupils equal and reactive to light so if you shine a light in his eyes they should constrict if you are in a dark area they should open up for more light to get in his skin or her skin should be warm and easily descendable and basically what that is is it should just be pliable should be very pliable and warm. The extremities, as the webbings of his toes, should also be warm to touch. Right? There shouldn't be any of them that are cold, per se. Above all, make sure you know your dog or dogs. Know his breaths per minute. You know, know them at rest. Know them when he's working. Know his pulse. Know it at rest and when he's working. Know your dog's weight. Make sure that you know what his normal gum color looks like. Check his capillary refill. Know what that is. Just know your dogs. Start to get into these routines. Look at your dog. Look at your dog differently. Just don't go out there and go, hey, what's up? Know your dog. Start to learn. Start to understand what he's telling you. He can't tell you, but he shows you. And that's the whole thing about when you're starting to read dogs. So we've talked about general guidelines of caring for your dogs. 
or any animal basically, and we have discussed assessments of dogs, whether it be, you know, part of a condition or just we're learning to, you know, assess the health of our dog on a daily basis. Let's start talking about, you know, hazards and conditions and uh, injuries that may be encountered by your dog, not so much just on the trail, but in general. You know, your dog may get loose one day and he may get hit by a car. You don't know, somebody may do something malicious to your dog. So let's start looking at some of these things now. So in the case of an emergency, when we're thinking about our dog, we need to have a plan, okay? And what I like to call it is a crash plan, and you can use that as your acronym. Uh, when you're actually looking at your dog, you want to make that quick, rapid assessment on him, and we want to look for a few things right away. The first thing is the A in A crash plan, and that would be for your airway. The C itself stands for cardiac, so you want to want to check and make sure that he still has a heartbeat. You're going to want to check his rate of heartbeat. Heartbeat. You want to check and see whether or not it's thready. Okay, that's all things in uh, what you're going to be looking for uh, in his pulse and whatnot. The next thing you're going to want to check is his respiratory rate. All right, we already know that we're going to look, listen, and feel just like we would with a human as we're given CPR. All right, we're going to check again. We're going to make sure whether or not he has good solid breaths. We're going to want to make sure that they are full, that they are not um, quivering in any way. Um, we're going to check his chest as we're doing that to feel the chest, make sure there's no segments in there that could actually be broken if he wound up taking a fall or if uh, you suspect, you know, that the dog may have been kicked or you know, hit by a car or something of that nature. The next thing that we want to check is we want to check his abdomen. And what we're going to do, come here boy, Tonka, come here, the oh boy, all right, you're going to check his abdomen. Where are you going? Hey, silly. Come here, you over here. All right, so you're going to want to check his abdomen, all right. You're going to look for any distension in his abdomen. Feel it. Is it rigid? Is it hard? All right, that could be a sign of fluid building up in his abdomen. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about the spine. All right, start here at the base of his head, work your way down his back, down the long axis of his back, okay? You know, let him know, okay, that you're there. See, he's going to sit for me because I know he's a little bit older and he's got a little bit of arthritis there, okay? But you're going to want to feel if there's any deformities in his spine. Right. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to check his head. All right. Check his head. See if there's any deformities. Feel if there's any deformities. Get to know your dog. Check his jaw. See if his jaw is out of whack. You know, look in his ears. You know, you're going to be looking for any blood, any um, spinal fluid that he may have in there, as well. All right. Get to know him. Let him know that you know this is all just a game to him that you learn, or that he will learn, as a puppy when he's growing up. Yeah, but from his head, we're gonna move down into his pelvis area, all right? If the dog is like really hurt, and he's, and he's pretty much out of it, you have to realize too that if he's hurt and he's still ambulant, ambulant, ambulatory, that, um, you know, he might be snapping at you. And it's not because he's angry at you or anything like that, it's just because he hurts. All right, and he doesn't know any other thing other than pain. Hey, come here. Silly. Good boy. Um, from the pelvis, we're going to go into his limbs. Check his limbs. Again, feel for any deformities. Start on one side. Come here. Oh, boy. There. Come here. Come here. Be a superstar. Come here. Come on. Now you want to run outside. Okay. Well, he's going to run outside. So check his legs. You know, check his limbs. Start down one side, feel them. See if there's any shortening of that limb in comparison to the other one that's next to it. See if there's any deformities. See if there's any bleeding. And check all his limbs. Okay? Oh, you're back? You gonna come in? Huh? Come on. No? Go. Go. Go then. I don't want to talk to you. All right. The next thing that you're gonna to want to check is you're gonna to want to check for any major arteries and bleeding. 
Obviously, you're going to see if there's any large amounts of blood that are already there, and you're going to have to um, address that up in your cardiac phase. You know he's still pumping. Well, if there's an extra large amount of blood out there, you're going to have to stop that blood right away because we don't want him to go into shock. Okay, hypovolemic shock would be the first thing that would stem from loss of fluids. And then lastly, what you're going to do is you're going to wind up, you know, looking at any nerve damage or things like that. And pretty much the vet is going to be able to tell you all that. You're just going to have to report to the vet anything that you see. And again, you know, these are all things that you're going to do, all right, prior to you getting to the vet. But you have to take note of all these things, you know, whether it be injury or whether it be you know, what appears to be sickness or poisoning of that nature. This is just to help you with the guidelines and give you an order of priority things to look for um, while he's there. So again, so that's called a crash plan. We'll put it up on a whiteboard and we'll take a look at that as well.